Hey, this is Toby Mathis. Welcome back to the Anderson Business Podcast. I am excited today because I, for any of you guys who recognize our guest out there, first off, it's Joey DeMaio of the band Man of War. If you guys recognize that name, that's awesome. It means you're metalhead. If, if, if you don't, then I want to set the stage as to as to who Joey is. And Joey, just give me a minute, and you're gonna have to you're gonna have to endure some of this. But I want to make sure that people understand the breadth and scope of the artist that we have in front of us and business person that we have in front of us, because um, it doesn't matter what you do, the way you do it is speaks volumes. And I think Joey and I would agree on that. I think Joey, you would agree because we were talking earlier about. Even sweeping a floor, you do it the best of your ability. But uh, Joey is the owner of something called Valhalla Studios in New York. And, and Joey, I'm going to ask for your help on this real quick, because is it the most accurate depiction of audio in the planet on the United States? Is it like one of the top studios as far as the accuracy of the music? Well, not to... Not to um pat ourselves on the shoulder, but we're, we're proud of the fact that we have two very um, similar, but yet very different control rooms, uh, recording studios for that matter, that are both extremely uh, accurate and have been certified for Dolby Atmos, Sony 360, and Oro 3D. And the studio I'm sitting in now has just been named the reference control room for Oro 3D uh, by the actual inventor of not only the format, which is a super high fidelity, very pure uh, immersive audio format, but he's also the inventor of the greatest recording studio in the world, Galaxy Studios in Belgium. So we just received that certification uh, two or three weeks ago and just could have knocked me over with a feather when he said that. So first off, congratulations. But second off, that means that you, in the whole world, have one of the highest, probably the, I don't even, that, is there an even higher certification or is that the highest certification that's even out there right now? It's the highest certification that they could give for their format, for what they are doing in immersive audio, for what they have invented and what they believe to be uh, the most accurate way to reproduce that particular format. See, right there, you're in rare air. And this is what's really exciting. So we'll get back to that. I managed to make it through almost one sentence before I had to bring you in. Uh, so I have to finish, do a couple of things so people know who you are 100%. Uh, he also owns Magic Circle Entertainment Group and founded as uh, the, the bass guitarist and lyricist, engineer, and producer of the world-renowned metal band, call it rock band, Manowar, who, gosh, you've been around since... Since when? Get, get, give people an idea. The band was formed in 1980. And you guys have been rocking it ever since. And I can say, because I went to your concert in Athens last year with with, with uh, one of our guys, Kareem the Dream here, who just is a is, is a uh, true metalhead and he's an encyclopedic knowledge of this stuff, but uh, still doing world tours and killing it. In fact, you're about to head out on another one, aren't you? Correct, in about two weeks. Jeez Louise. All right. So I have to get through some of this stuff because it's 1980 and it's over, what is it, 19 albums? I think 14, something like that. But I mean, if you count live albums and singles and EPs, of course, it's right around that number. And you've done over 35 world tours. So like you've been on the road. Like when people say, oh, I hit the road, 35 actual world tours. Yeah, and I've racked up some frequent flyer miles in that time, that's for sure. And you do everything, right? Like you're self-managed, you guys do everything through uh, Magic Circle Entertainment Group, right? Yes, not not by choice. I never found my Peter Grant. As you know, Peter Grant was the legendary manager of Led Zeppelin, and he was like a, a fifth member of the band. And he was just, you know, I think he was the ma standard by which all managers at least at that time, were judged and probably, you know, still should be in many ways. Here's the things that amaze me. So, you know, I'm not going to just keep beating on you because you, you have a pedigree that's a mile long. But you're also a PhD in music, right? Yes, I, I have been fortunate enough to have that honor bestowed upon me uh, through a couple of organizations in Europe that look for people who... Uh, 
are able to achieve something um, and share it with the world. And therefore, you are passed among a group of people who are experts in any particular area, and they kind of evaluate you, what you have been able to do, and they then are able to say, well, certainly he is deserving of a bachelor's degree or a master's degree or a PhD or so forth. It's it's more an, I would say, an honorary degree in the sense that I don't think I could take it to Yale and walk through the door and say, I'm ready to teach. On the other hand, as one of the gentlemen told me, he said, well, how many teachers do you think that are out there that have you know, had a career and understand and do what you do and sold 30 million records? So I think that you know, the practical experience should should kind of weigh in the way it, it did in ancient Greece. You had to actually prove yourself by doing. Yeah. You, nowadays we get the piece of paper and then we go out and we try to make our career. And some people go back, but for the most part, uh, we tend to ignore the, the world of experience. Um, but I just wanted to touch on that because you have a background. I remember you did Jesus Christ Superstar and a bunch of production in things other than metal, right? Like you, th that was something you did uh, with orchestras. And I know that you've done composing and you've done some really cool stuff. Uh, but you're not just, hey, I'm a, you know, I've been in a metal band since 1980. That's one of the most successful metal bands on the, on the planet. In the United States, we would love to see more following, but you have a huge worldwide following, like just for kicks and giggles, go out there and Google Manowar and look at some of the concerts. I, I know that there's one uh, Warriors of the World, I believe, I, I'm trying to think of where it was, it might have been in Brazil, but 75, 80 million views or some astounding number. Yeah. Uh, you have a huge fan base around the world, right? Very, very fortunate and very blessed to have come upon a style of music that as long as you are true to your music and you're true to the fans and your quality you know, never dips, I, I think you could play for your whole life. And I've always admired bands like, well, that are still playing today. I mean, in Europe, at least, you have bands like Uriah Heep, Deep Purple, um, Led Zeppelin could play for the rest of their lives, ACDC, uh, even Metallica, who are a current band, but they, of course, started in the 80s or, or maybe even sooner. And I think this kind of music uh, is something that is a lifestyle and people just like bands and stay with them in this genre. So I was fortunate enough to fall in love with this style of music um, early on. And briefly about what you were talking earlier, I was lucky enough to land a job in a pit orchestra for a couple of Broadway musicals, which kind of really put me on the path to understanding and studying classical music. So I think that's that's what you were talking about. And that was also just a wonderful experience and a tremendous education, really studying with some excellent musicians. I mean, really world-class orchestral musicians. And it, it kind of made me realize that everything I had done up to that point was good foundational work for performing live, but to work with studied musicians that could really read music and understand theory, harmony, counterpoint, orchestration, arranging, all of the other things that are so vital to and can be applied and are applied to rock and quote unquote pop music or any recording at all. It was a, a blessing to just kind of fall into that. It was it was good fortune. Good luck. When did you realize that your livelihood in your life was going to be music? Well, I saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan when I was 10 years old, and it was October of 64. And I said, well, my God, that's definitely for me. I mean, it, it, nothing could be more perfect. You know, long hair, girls screaming, play a guitar. This just looks wonderful. I saw them, at, you know, the pictures of them at the airport landing on the jet. And I said, well, this is obviously something that's right for me. Um, and then after playing early on, I actually joined a band almost immediately, a couple of weeks with, after I took lessons, even though I didn't really know what I was doing, uh, I suddenly realized that that hour on stage is interesting and fun, but the other 23 involve things like logistics, counting, and all of the other components that without, you certainly can't get on stage and play. 
And so there's this idea of, yeah, I, this is a business podcast, so I'm going to bring it back to the business of music. So you, you're talking to people out there that maybe they're a musician, maybe they're thinking about becoming a musician or taking it to the next level. What are a few things that people would be surprised to know about the business of music, having been on it on the inside for decades? What are a few little yeah. nuggets? Yeah, a good question. I think that the musicians of today, need to really think of yourself as a split personality. And I don't I don't mean become a psycho or anything. I mean that I think musicians today are more cognizant of the fact that we are in the music business. And that means no business, no music, no music, no business. So the band feeds everybody. If the band doesn't play or the band doesn't record, no one else, including the band, eats. But if the band plays and the band records, everyone eats. And going outward from the band members to their immediate families and the crews that set up the equipment and maintain it and work on it, music stores, agents, managers, record companies, publishers, merchandise companies, internet providers now that music is being distributed digitally, everything um, spider webs outward from the kernel, the center of, of the nucleus, and that is the band and the music. And so I think a, a real firm understanding of the mechanics of the business and of course the finances of it are essential uh, for musicians today. Not that that's a new concept, because if you read the lives of some of the great composers, for instance, Paganini, these guys, they died with money. They were smart about how they use their money. And in my case, I'm not so smart about how I use it, because I take and reinvest just about everything I have back into um, something that will feed the machine in a way that I can relate to it. For instance, recording studios or investing in the best busing, trucking, lighting, sound, so I can enhance our performance and give our fans 300% value for their ticket. I mean, 100% today, it's not enough. The competition out there is rabid. So I feel that I have to exceed, you know, at least, you know, 150%, you know, consistently to give the fans the feeling that what we're doing is really from the heart and it's all for them. And I think you have to really go that extra mile. And if you're not prepared to commit to a life, um, kind of a Zen life of a monk in terms of your dedication to your instrument, to your music, to what you create, then you better be lucky enough to have an uncle that works at a record company mm -hmm. or somewhere that you can just do whatever you want, but still do your art and have it work. My structure is very much hands-on and based that way out of necessity. But if you want to be in this business just for fun, um, there's not a lot of fun worrying about the financial side, but there could be an incredible amount of fun if somebody else is dealing with it that is going to ensure that the finances um, all balance at the end of the year or at the end of the week or at the end of the night. And so these are things that I think that are, are essential building blocks for any business. And that's why this podcast is fun for me, because business is business, you know, and if it doesn't make dollars, it doesn't make sense. You know, you know, the old saying, right? It can be a it can be a nice hobby otherwise. <clears throat> but if you want to <laughs> actually make your living in the industry, it sounds like you have to jump in and make a full commitment unless you get lucky. And you, you, you brought up something that's very, very true. And, and I, this goes for people who just really enjoy playing. And I have so many clients and people, you know, because I have a consulting company as well. I have so many people that are in their mid 50s and they're like, look, I, you know, I'm ready now to make a record. You know, I've, I'm retired or semi retired or I'm in a financial position where I want to buy that dream guitar and amplify. And it's like, that is amazing because you're really doing something that's pure and from the heart. And it doesn't matter whether you want to play country or jazz or blues or you're going to do something from the heart and it's going to be great. You know, and when I mean it's going to be great, it's going to be great because it's pure because you're making it because you love it. Just the way somebody starts out and completely without knowing what's going to happen, they just bang on the guitar. Hey, it's pure. 
And that's great because if you're doing it for that reason, then you're always going to be happy. You're not doing it necessarily for the money. But if you're doing it for the money, then you have to think about other parameters. But like you said, you can be just as happy in your garage with a few friends, you know, and a few beers and blast and have a great time. It's it's all knowing what you really want from the business because you'll get from this business what you put into it. Exactly proportionate. You know, five hours a day, that's what you'll get back. That's a good way to look at it. And it's kind of like, because the people that get their guitar and then they're going to play it and then all of a sudden they want to be in a band and then they're wondering why they're not getting signed. And now we have the internet. So like when you started, um, you didn't have the internet, right? You, no, it, it, it was, you got on TV or the radio, right? To get heard. Right. Was that really it? What, what Anything else? Maybe, maybe live venue? Yeah, there were magazines. Yeah, back then the magazine, the rock magazines were important. And of course, touring is always important because if you can't deliver a great performance live of the music that you've recorded, then, you know, you're missing, you're missing half of the fun. First of all, personally, I think the audience is missing the half that they're kind of looking forward to after they get a recording. So you know, you, you got to be able to get out there and deliver and, and kick ass right. in whatever you do, just like a sports game. I mean, you know, yep. you got to be able to bring it. Well, and, yeah. I, and I've, I've witnessed you bringing it. And speaking of man of war and bringing it, can you do a little bit like explain to somebody who doesn't know who man of war is, what man of war is about your music, your fans? Why do you have this huge following quite literally what 40 some years later? From your yeah, I, I think um, I think we I think we were fortunate that the music that we perform and the lyrics are based in empowering people to shrug off a lot of the things that you deal with growing up that maybe you hang on to. Mm -hmm. uh, when I started playing at, at ten years old, I can tell you I didn't get a lot of encouragement um, for from even members of my own family, friends, people. Turn it down. And turn it down. It, 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 it's too loud. Or who do you think you are? Get a lunchbox and go to work. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, you hear this stuff and you're thinking, well, you know, but why I'm seeing these people in magazines, my heroes, I got their record. I mean, you know, I read that this guy came from Indiana. I read from this guy came from uh, Pennsylvania. And I think you carry a lot of that, you know, and I wanted to, be able to inspire people to realize that it doesn't matter who you are. Everybody has the right to be themselves. It doesn't matter. Other people cannot and are unable to define anybody else. If, if that was the case, then we could go to somebody and they could say, oh, yes, I can clearly see that you are a nuclear physicist. You know, that's great. Or, you know, you live in Vegas. Or no, I can see that you are a top high roller. Go there you know, and bet the farm and you're guaranteed to win. It doesn't exist. So I wanted to write some kind of music that would make people feel empowered, powerful. Um, and I've always liked movies where in the end, you know, you saw those Clint Eastwood movies where the guy rides into town, he's a stranger, nobody knows him. They beat the life out of him. And then he comes back and kills all the bad guys and rides off at the end of the movie with the girl on the horse. I think not necessarily that framework, but the sentiment behind it is there's got to be some good in it for the good people, you know? And if you feel that way about yourself, you gotta, you've got to hang on to that and not let, let yourself get beat down. I, I saw an interview with Henry Winkler once where they were talking to him about his audition. And he said, you know, uh, I was going to go in for the Fonz. And I reminded myself every day, there's a little guy on my shoulder. And he whispers in my ear, you can do it. You, you got the stuff. Don't worry. And then there's this other guy going, yeah, right. Don't listen to him. He goes, mm -hmm. and if you don't beat that guy down every day, he gets taller and taller. And I thought that was a pretty good analogy. I think, you know, you got to remind yourself that you got the right to be happy and don't listen to other people. Because if you do, you could have spent that time practicing a guitar or practicing your singing or practicing your business mathematics or you're investing, whatever you want to do. You, you just got to believe in yourself and not put the blinders on like they do with those horses and just keep going straight. And that's kind of the essence of the music. And I think the honesty of what we're trying to say is time honored. I mean, I'm not inventing anything new. I'm just, you know, 
repeating some of the great phrases and some of the great feelings that all these amazing books, the Iliad, the Odyssey, you know, uh, have brought brought to life and some of the classic stories about all these great heroes. And those were the kind of movies that were made when I was young. So naturally that influenced me to want to realize that I think everybody could be and is a hero in their own way. I mean, you know, the fireman that runs in and saves a baby from a building, that guy's a hero. You know, the guy that works and puts food on the table for his family, like my dad, that guy was a hero, you know? And I think everybody is their own hero and should be. And if somebody tells you different, I, you're not, they're not friends. Yeah, and so somebody should go listen to Man of War and put yourself in that state of mind of like, uh, I just punched my mic. Yeah. You know, they, and feel good about yourself. And for, you know, for the time that you're at that concert, you're with other people mm -hmm. that want to be there to enjoy the fact that you're going to recharge your batteries. You're going to get away from the stuff we all have to deal with. I mean, we have to face reality, but it doesn't mean we can't take time away from it, you know, to enjoy a good movie or a good dinner or a great concert or, or have fun in whatever way we do. Yeah, absolutely. Well said and uh, puts everything kind of in perspective. Now, for you, you are immersed in the business of music, not just from the production and the you're actually playing and you have another you have multiple businesses that are associated in the industry. Uh, but you've had a lot of success in all of them. So like the band Manowar has been going out and st still going out on tour. But you also have is it two or three studios now that you have running that are professional grade studios that you actually two, two? and mm -hmm. I mean, you've won awards or scores have been written there and produced there correctly that are correct that have, have actually won. What was the most recent? Uh, the first, actually, the first one that we did was quite a surprise. We uh, did a film uh, called Judas and the Black Messiah. Mm -hmm. and that was a, an amazingly powerful film. And it was just a shock to us, you know, the, the gentleman mixing it. Jim Anderson, he's one of the most foremost jazz engineers in the world. And uh, he's used to working at places like Skywalker Ranch. Mm -hmm. And uh, he came to us and said, you know, I'd like to uh, check out the studio. And he mixed it. And we ended up winning awards for that movie, which was which was just a knockout, you know. And that was during COVID besides. So, yeah, things things like that pump you up with good energy. In addition to that, I, I have a consulting company as well for people that, um, are interested in in the music business. Um, in in addition to that, we sell our own merchandise, print it. I go to the printery mm -hmm. and I look at every shirt, to make sure that everything is up to the standards of quality, and you know, kind of hands on in all the various entities that that compose um, the structure that is required to house and maintain a band, recording the music, distributing mm -hmm. it, um, performing, playing. The travel, the logistics, all of that's addressed, you know, by myself personally and the team of people. I have two great people. I have uh, Manuel Arruda, who's our business affairs manager, who you met. And, of course, Suzanne Wagner, you know, who's our operations manager. I mean, you know, without these two people, I wouldn't be able to do what I do. And along with the rest of the wonderful people you've also met on tour, I'm, I'm very, very blessed, I have to say. i got to tell you, I, I just like Susan's Suzanne's last name because... Every time I think of Wagner, I think of what is it, uh, Flight of the Valkyrie, and it, it's the right. old multiple. I don't know, you, goofy things, but it's just the da 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 da. da. We used to always sing multiple. Absolutely, yeah, multiple. Yeah, what a, what a, uh, multiple. Example. So uh, yeah, I always That's example what I'm talking about mm -hmm. though. When you hear that music, you you how could you possibly be down? How could you be depressed? You hear that music. You know, you're, you you fill yourself up like a balloon with good energy. But Wagner also typifies everything you just said because he had to get sponsors to basically support him while he wrote some of the most amazing operas. For those of you guys who don't know Wagner, Wagner, just Google Wagner and you'll recognize probably five or six. Like everybody's wedding walks out to, 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 to Wagner. And it's like one of the greatest composers of all time. And he would have to move away from his family to go so somebody would support him and so he could write an opera. Yes, and I think that's the, that's the thing also about musicians. And a lot of that um, has not changed because 
musicians traditionally did rely on support, well, I guess we still do, um, from people that had the financing. I mean, when you start out today, you need the big money from a big record company in order to be a big artist. And it, you know, do people break through? Sure, they break through to a point. But from that point, if you're going to be a Beyonce, you need the machine that works with the Beyonce's, the Lady Gaga's, the Madonna's, and so mm -hmm. forth, the Jay Z's, and all of these people. That's that's a whole different level of success, and you kind of prove yourself worthy of that by the work that you do and the quality of the work. And it's 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 something that you know has to be forged over time. So what do you say to somebody? Let's say that it's a small band. And I always think of, I think of young people, but here in Vegas, I'm realizing there's a lot of bands. There's punk bands here where the front man is 50 some years old. And I'm looking at them like, they're just really grinding away, crafting their, their trade. They have their following. And then you hear about people signing with the label. You know, you always hear like, oh, I finally got signed. I was in Seattle when the grunge thing hit and everybody and their mother was getting signed. And then you'd never hear from them again. Like, I always thought it was Correct. like the black pit. You know, what, what do they do? They take you and produce your album. It didn't sell and you're gone. What do you say Correct. to somebody? Yeah. Is, is, is that a route that people should really be considering? Is that the ultimate goal? Or would you advise people, hey, you know what? Do your own thing. Create your own. Like, the Internet's so different nowadays. You get things out there. What, what's your advice to, especially the young artists? Well, as I said, I have a consulting company and I, <clears throat> I have people that will contact me and want to come in and say, oh, you know, would you speak with my son or my daughter? You know, she wants to be an actress. He wants to be a, a, you know, a uh, rock star and mm -hmm. so forth. And I'll use that word because it, it's a popular word. And the first thing I'll say is, why, why do you want to uh, be in this business? Well, what makes you want to do it? You know, and you can tell immediately somebody whose intention is because I love music and I want to play music. Now, then the next question is, would you be happy the rest of your life if you never made any money and you just want to play music? Would would that be enough for you just to simply say, you know what, I play my guitar, I play in a little bar every now and then I, you know, have a beer and I have a sandwich, I have a modest apartment. I, you know, I'm lucky to be able to support myself and my music. I give lessons and that's my life. It's a very Zen way of thinking, right? I mean, do you know many martial artists who, other than MMA guys, who are looking at the financial aspect? I mean, some of the people that I have met who have been, you know, true masters, I don't believe they went into it for the money. Now, they may have used and parlayed their success after a certain point and been able to monetize it. But I think the initial thought was, I just love this and I want to do it. Like, why does a sculptor sculpt? You know, so I think the intention has to be clear in the person. If they want to be a rock star or an entertainer or a performer, that's a different thing than being a musician because a musician can play his music in his bedroom. He doesn't need a record company. Mm -hmm. He can play his music in his living room, play by himself, play in the subway. You know, that's, that's a musician, somebody who just wants to play particular instrument and somebody who wants to perform live in front of 50,000 people well you may still be a musician and a great musician but you have to have a different set of priorities and how you devote your time mm -hmm. and for me I feel that in order to be a great musician if that's what you want then most of your life is going to be spent becoming a great musician. Whether you're going to be a composer, you're going to have to sit around and compose until you compose something that's so amazing that it's enough to speak to you to then show it to the world. Or maybe not. Maybe you just don't want to show it to the world. And you're able to support yourself and live into in whatever style makes you happy uh, simply by listening to your own music in your house. So, you know, it's this vision of yourself. Where are you? Where do you see yourself in two years? Where do you see yourself in eight years? Or do you see yourself in 20 years? Because you're in 20 years, you're going to be 20 years mm -hmm. older. So is that, are you going to still be happy playing in a local bar for 50 people? Nothing wrong with it. It's great. I mean, I have tons of friends that do that and they're completely fulfilled and they're completely happy. They, some of them have tried this thing and said, you know, I tried it. I did it. And it was cool. 
for a while, but I can't see myself doing it. I can't see myself living out of a suitcase like you, you know? Um, so I think it's being clear, you know, with yourself, with your parents, with whoever's going to be around helping you, uh, that the investment that's going to need to be made by yourself, you know, spiritually, emotionally, in terms of your time, your effort, and somebody's going to have to pay for you to live while you're practicing 10, 12 hours a day, you know? So I think these are the things that have to be the most important thing, clarity of purpose. So it, that is really good advice, but somebody starting out, where does the money come from? Like, are they getting paid to go play places? Are they getting a beer because they, they, they played at a place or they get, hey, you get an open tab or you get a few dollars or are they making their money from a record label who's selling their albums? Is it the merchandise? If somebody is getting started out, where where does the money come from? Because I know you do these big, huge world tours. That's got to be millions of dollars of expenditure, and you're hoping to to obviously get that back plus a return. But most people couldn't do that. I mean, they, they don't have that type of money or that type of following. So, where where do you monetize these things? Well, when you you know taking myself as an example, and I think. I think it's a good example because I was born into a very, very, I would say, middle class family. My father made $50 a week on the police force. My mother made $50 a week. I was an accountant at General Electric. And in those days, they were able to save one paycheck. Um, but that's the way that I grew up. Mm -hmm. And in that scenario, all the gigs that I played, you know, we split up the money. We, we ended up making $10 each. So you didn't really make enough money to live on your own had I not lived with my parents. And in fact, I never saw any real money to speak of until I was probably in my early 30s. Even my first record deal uh, at, at 26 years old, we got $150,000, 50 to make a record, 50 to do a tour, and 50 to buy equipment. Mm -hmm. That deal is still unrecouped today. So I think these learning curves that one has to go through in business are, are important lessons to people because... There is no money until you do something of value mm -hmm. that proves you can monetize what you're doing. Now, there are outlets. There are people that just sit in their bedroom and make YouTube videos, and they do pretty well financially, I have to say. So there, there is a way to make a living today mm -hmm. if that is the road you want to go. But you know, those people, I don't think, tour that much or have the other side. I think you have to confine yourself to that audience that tunes in and watches you on TV. But it's like the old story. You can't get money from a bank until you prove to them you don't need it. And I think you can't get a good record deal until you can prove to the record company that you don't need them. They need you. Because without musicians and music, what are they going to sell? I mean, I know a girl who's making 200000 bucks a year. And she's perfectly happy, homeschools her kids. She makes videos and music in her bedroom, and it's beautiful, and she sings beautiful. And she's been approached by every major record company, and she's, she just tells them, look, I'm making 200 a year. If you can do better than that by at least double, I'll talk to you. If not, I don't need to change what I'm doing. I'm very happy. And it is a new world. Mm -hmm. So, But she's one of these exceptional people that is very driven, very motivated, very talented, and puts everything uh, in, into her music. And I think it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. You know, If this life is you, or whatever life you choose, sports, business, basketball, if it's you, you're going to find your way through everybody else because you're wading through the people that are come see, come sa. They're not 100% sure. You know, when a chance comes to advance themselves, will they take it? I don't know. They're going to think, while they're thinking, you put your hand on your chin, you're dead. Somebody yeah. already took the deal. It, it, you, know? you have to be ready to strike when, when the opportunity presents itself. I just think that's absolutely, I mean, people don't even realize that they had the opportunity. With nothing to hold you back. Yep. With, without, without even a split second thought. I mean, my bags are packed from the last trip. You know, I washed the clothes, repacked my my toiletries case sits on my bathroom uh, table. It's there. I shave out of it. I work out of it. If the phone rings, I am literally able to zip up that toiletries bag, throw it in my suitcase 
get in the car and go to the airport. And I, I've done that many, many times. I mean, I've, I've flown to Europe, got off the plane, had a breakfast meeting in the morning, a lunch meeting in the afternoon, a dinner meeting at five at night and got on a flight back at seven at night to come back home. I mean, you can't let the grass grow beneath your feet. It's called dedication and commitment. Sometimes we ignore that part. Hey, uh, for all the fans out there, where is Man of War headed now? Where's your music headed now? I know you were doing some pretty cool stuff on the most recent recordings. It seems like you're always changing it up. It's never just the same thing over and over again. So for all your fans, where is Man of War headed? Well, we... You know, as you know, we have a new guitarist in the band, and he's one of the most famous guitarists in the world. His name's Michelangelo Badio. I'm sure a lot of people that do watch your podcast, Toby, will know who he is. And those who don't, you've got to look him up, if for nothing more than to watch this guy who's completely like ambidextrous. Play two guitars, yeah. you know, and, and two different things with two different hands, but he also has a guitar with four necks, and he spins it around. He's got, like, two necks this way and then two necks on the bottom, and he's just... He just looks like a hydra of some sort or an octopus. So with somebody like that in the band, um, it, it's a real kick in the ass for somebody like myself to stand on stage next to this guy and, and have to rise as best I can to his level of virtuosity. So I think that's a great inspiration uh, for myself and also the rest of the band. You know, new blood brings new energy, but different energy because he's an individual. And what he brings to, to the band is not just speed, but he's he's a personality. He's a virtuoso. And we also have a new drummer uh, who is now just starting to really get comfortable with the fact that, you know, he's in the band and has done a tour and so forth. So we're expecting even greater things from him. So there's just a new energy, new dynamic and a lot of fun. And I guess this is just another chapter in the Book of Man of War. Musically. Well, we're excited to read it and see it, and uh, I, I'm going to wish you great luck on your tour. Uh, I, I, I can't end without asking, you did get the world record for the world's loudest band, right? Only because I was foolish enough to spend the money and the time to research how to break okay. the record so that no one would ever be foolish enough to spend that kind of money and put in that kind of time and effort. Uh, scientifically to to beat it <laughs> but you uh, a couple of times you still have it though right yeah i was incensed because somebody beat our record by uh, i think they had an uncle that owned a music store they hooked up everything in the music store and i thought that was cheating because they didn't do it in a stadium equipment. you got to do it in a live set well it doesn't matter where you do it you should own the equipment and it should be the equipment that you perform with live not you know, not rent it as a stunt. <laughs> well, I, I'm funny. I'm funny like that. Sorry. I still love it. I had another client who just broke a world record of uh, the number of bungee jumps off of a bridge. And she did it within an hour. And I think it was some ridiculous number, like 20 jumps. <laughs> How cool. How cool. We also have the record for the longest heavy metal concert. We played five hours, I think 10 or 11 Jeez minutes Louise. in Bulgaria. How do your fingers feel mm -hmm. after that? That's the only thing that I could think of. <laughs> Sweaty. It was probably 150 degrees in Bulgaria. It was a beautiful night for it, though. And we just had so much fun. The crowd kept screaming. We just kept playing it little, little by little. We're like, I'm going to play another song. Play That's another the beautiful song. thing, though. Is that, yeah, you were probably in what we call, what everybody would say is the zone. You're just There's loving one. it. Nothing else matters. You're in your element. I think you could probably do that in your bedroom if you were really in love with your music and you were doing those types of things or whatever it is that you did. I think I think you're, you make it. Yeah, I think that's right. When you're when you're when you're invested in it, you know, it's in you. You're in it. You know, all of a sudden, there's it takes on a life. Absolutely. Well, I really appreciate your time, Joy. People need to go check out Man of War. It's probably the greatest band that you've never heard of. If if, if you're a metalhead, you know who they are. If you're listening to pop music, you you haven't heard of them yet. Go out there and listen to it because they have a really cool community and a really great following. And it's going to be people you never realized love that type of music too. And uh, and it's the real deal. You don't have to wonder whether this is some new band or something. This is decades of experience coming through from a true artist at the top of his game. So thanks, Joey, for having us or having it.
and and thank you for inviting me. This is this has been a lot of fun. I was I was really excited um, to get the invitation, and uh, you know what what can I say? You know I'm glad that you appreciate what we do. Certainly, you know I'm a huge fan of you and your company and what you do. And 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 I as I said before, you know I I am very very thankful that I learned early on that you really have to embrace the business aspect of of what you're doing in order to fully enhance and control what you're doing so that if you know i'm playing a festival and i determine Mm -hmm. that we have to double or triple the pa system to make sure everybody can hear it with the same quality as they would hear it in their living room if they had a fifty thousand dollar stereo then i'm able to do it because i'm in control of it and i think that's uh that's a really important thing and that that in itself is is a gift to be authenticity 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 there we go authenticity there we go it's authentic and it's your i mean shoot it's you it's your name out there and i think that uh, having that control just shows that you actually value it I, I worry about the people out there that give up that control and then they can't be them true well i think sooner or later you you get it back you know we, we've all gone through different different phases with um with bad record deals shall we say as an example or something. And sooner or later, you know, it ends and you're better off for it. You've learned and you've grown. And if you, if you can take it that way and you become stronger, you become smarter and you, you don't become bitter because you, you embrace the knowledge, you know, going back to your martial arts, we had, I used to have an instructor that would go to every city and he would want to spar with the instructor and I, I used to say to him i said well aren't you afraid you're going to get your ass you know your ass kicked by this guy and he would say no i'm hoping that he will kick my ass so i can thank him and say can you please show me what i did wrong you know those three different times when you hit me here hit me there he goes no i he goes i want to learn from these guys i would have even more respect for the guy you know if he did and that's what we that's what we should be doing in all of our businesses you're going out there to look to find the pain points so you can improve and get better Absolutely. Eternal students all the way. 100%. Thanks, Joey, for, 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 for coming on. My pleasure. Thank you, Toby.